you're in the middle of a Tony season, you're tired, uh, <laughs> and I appreciate you taking the time to talk. The coffee's helping. The coffee's helping a little bit. It's, it's really stressful though, isn't it? I mean... Uh, it's fascinatingly stressful. I'm trying to figure out like why it's so stressful. It shouldn't be. But there is this sort of, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in sort of uh, the whole subject of even interviews about plays and like, what does it do to your relationship to the play? What is it, you know, and, and, and as you kind of go into this meta mode and start reflecting on the play, you have these sort of new realizations, then you have new ideas about the play, and, and you, you, you almost want to kind of like go back in and do even more rewrites in the course of, of the interview process. But um, yeah, it's, 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 it, it's, uh, it's so funny to be able to, I'm trying to you know, have other plays to be working on, and it's, it's the same part of the brain that does the writing, is also the same part of the brain that I kind of use when I, when I talk to people about a play. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of, I'm coming to terms with. You're well, draining this is, this now. Is, well, it's just also like, I, I, I'm trying to figure out like how to, how to use the, interviews to fuel future writing. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of, after I talk to people about the play, I go off and like I write my notebooks about other plays and see if there's ideas that came out of the conversation that I just had with you and use those in a new play. Now you put a lot of pressure on me. I know. <laughs> if your next play isn't I'm like good. Going, I'm so. going so meta now this morning. <laughs> like, but there's just a, a, a financial pressure. I mean, at every stage, it feels like when it's off off Broadway, and even off Broadway, they're building a pool, they're doing things. But still, it feels like it's about the play, it's about the work, it's about the play, no matter what. The, but suddenly, now it's like big money, and I don't know how. And it's hard. It's like when you make a movie, you leap to a movie. Does it, is that are you able to just say no, no, no? It's about the work. I've been, you know what? Are you in studying this the particular, <laughs> No, not at all. And I've been kept. Um, uh, the, the whole team has sort of um, kept that out of the way. I mean, again, it's, it's the, the, when, when Rudin came to me and asked me uh, what I would need to bring this to Broadway, I basically asked for everything I would have in the course of getting a play ready for the Humana Festival. Mm -hmm. And we kind of built a process that resembles exactly what I would do getting ready to premiere something at the Humana Festival. And as a result, it actually made the whole process one where I'm actually not even thinking about how expensive stuff is. And or the marketing or... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, so I, I feel really fortunate to have been sort of spared a lot of that, that worry. Um, yeah. It's, and doing interviews, you're able to think, you're able to make that leap. No, I'm not talking about me and trying to win an award. I'm talking about the show and hoping to get people to see it. Oh yeah, the other didn't even occur to me. <laughs> Actually, now that I know that. It's a stressful night though, it really is. It's really a, it's, it's, yeah. you're like, no, I don't care, I don't care. Like, it's still hard because, you know, yeah. there it is. I mean, it helps that the other three playwrights and I are all great friends. I mean, we just went out and all had dinner the other night. Oh, that's and, cool. And we're planning another. Uh, you mean a real dinner, together. just you, not yeah, like just an, us, not some yeah. event. Just oh, us. We're just sort of like, it was, it was um, just a really nice time to spend time with each other and say, how are we all doing? How are you doing? <laughs> you, you've often said that you write plays to fill in gaps. What's missing? What's not being talked about? Or what kind of pieces can I tackle? So in this case, you felt yeah. like there weren't enough sequels to plays by Ibsen or... <laughs> I know. Well, that's, that's part of it. Like, yeah, uh, uh, I, I'm really interested in missing information and... and um, well, gaps in, in, in conversation, but also missing information, and what we don't know is what happened to Nora. So uh, I was, it was, it was drawn to that part of it, and um, uh, and the title. You've never been shy of a of a of a good title to lure people in, right? Yeah, From the start, you have yeah. fun. I mean, at Doll's House Part Two, that's where it started for you. Yeah, it did. It did, and then and then. Uh, the, the real work of building the play began when I, I found a really bad translation of Ibsen's play online, cut and pasted it into a Word document, and just started writing the whole thing in my own words. And I, I kind of stripped out a lot of things that, that feel very familiar about A Doll's House, so I stripped out, say, like, the macaroons. And, yeah. and I also stripped away some of the, the, the language we associate with Torval, the sort of, oh, my little lark, my little bird, squirrel, all that stuff. Squirrel, yeah. Because it became, I, I thought it was, 
he, in, in most translations, I mean, he's just so obviously so condescending and, and, and um, you know, seems to belittle her that I was curious what happens if you pull back on that a little bit? Um, are there more interesting ways in which he's belittling her that are less obvious? It's so easy to sort of watch Torvald and, and hear him call her a squirrel and, and, and just say, oh, that jerk. And I wanted to make it a little harder and, and see if there was something deeper underneath it. And, and it's, it's two things that became apparent. Um, the, and this sort of gets back to your question about like what's missing from a conversation. Um, it seems that the Nora and Torvald are both pretty bad communicators in the original play. They're, they're, they're tiptoeing around each other all the time. They're, they're, they're not wanting to upset the other too much and they don't want any conflict. Until the end, you know, when stuff blows up and, and, and Nora gets a chance to sort of start to be honest and then she walks out and that feels like a conversation that wants to keep going. Um, but of course, the, the, the other problem that sort of exists between them is they're, they're, they're living in these roles where, you know, there, there is an, in, an implicit understanding that Torvald owns Nora, mm -hmm. you know, and there's explicit and, and, is illegal. Right? Yeah, like, well, and that, yeah, she, but she, in, in how they interact with each other, there's a kind of um, presumption of ownership, and and again, that's another case where it's very easy to look at that and say, now we're, we're past that. And <laughs> <laughs> that's what's fascinating about the play: the idea that you can, wow, we're still wrestling with all these issues. There's very little that feels dated in terms of ownership and personal rights and control over your body and your yeah. freedom and your, so that's what's kind of upsetting and fascinating and fun about the show to realize 120 years or whatever later yeah we're still there yeah yeah i, I guess yeah no to, to i think i think you're right to sort of flag that that, 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 that implicit explicit uh, uh distinction because yes in in the original it, it, you're right it, it's more explicit and, I'm kind of interested in what are the ways they're a little harder to see, and can I make those more visible? Yeah, I have this book on my shelf. I, 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 I think, I think, the law school was throwing out books, and I pilfered a bin of books that mm -hmm. they were throwing out. And there's this one book called "What Do We Owe Each Other," and I've never actually read the book, but it sits on my shelf <laughs> and stares back at me. And I think it's actually been one of the sing that book has influenced me more than any other book, just simply because the what title. Do we owe each other? <laughs> and, and I feel like that's the running theme in in uh, every play I've written since I picked that book out of the bin so many years ago. Um, I'm, I'm, there's this question I have of like, how much should it, it, it's, there, there's this point where self-care hurts somebody else, mm -hmm. and, and how do you negotiate those situations? Um, you know, I guess there could be the argument that everything we do has a kind of ripple effect, that somehow it's hurting somebody, but uh, I'm interested in those cases where, where you're forced to confront the fact that I have to do what's right for me, but it's also having this effect on you, but uh, I, I mean, it's not an answerable question. Like, it's, it's just one that spins you back and forth, and so I think that's why I keep writing about it. Uh, I was born in South Florida. I grew up, oh no, what am I saying? I was born in Bermuda, but I grew up in South Florida in Pompano for a lot of Oh, okay, as yeah. A, as a kid, and you grew up in the Orlando area? Yeah, yeah, I was born in Miami Beach and grew up in Orlando. Um, Someone said Longwood or some other neighborhood. Well, I, I, you're right, I, I, at one point I, I moved to Longwood, uh, from about maybe age two to nine or eight, I was living uh, not far from Disney World mm -hmm. um, in some back roads near an orange grove and a gun range. Mm -hmm. and, That's uh, Florida. Very rural. Welcome Florida. to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then the family uh, moved to Longwood, Florida, which is uh, a bit less rural. And I guess they exist out west or whatever, but geodesic domes, you see them in Florida sometimes. You, drive, you go up in a geodesic dome. Yeah. I've been in them in a planetarium or something, I guess, but I've never been in a home like one. And I always thought, 
there's nowhere to hide. I always felt like there were no rooms and you couldn't, there's no corner for you to, you know, everywhere you went, people could see you. Lynn Nottage said to me, and mm -hmm. I've been wrestling with this ever since, she said it to me last week. She said, we were talking about childhood homes and she says, uh, she has a theory, I'm gonna butcher, butcher her theory a little bit, but um, she believes that your childhood home is secretly the dramaturgy of your plays. <laughs> your your play structures, the er structure of your plays, has some relationship to your childhood home. And, 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 mean, and what does that mean? You, well, you actually might have solved it for me because I was wondering, wait, what does it mean to have grown up in a geodesic home? And you're right that it is it is a circle that all the walls are curved. There's no corner to back into, literally. Right. And and. Um, uh, it, it is there is it is an intensely theatrical space um, because there are uh, rooms built up into the center of it and it feels like a, an arena of some kind. Wow. Um, so it, it's that may say a lot about why I'm drawn to plays that are public forums. Yeah. So you, uh, you you grew up in uh, Orlando and that's where you were had learned the joy of promotion and not being afraid of uh, you know the fun and the artifice and the, and the selling of, uh, of stuff and you also yeah. uh, you you did act in school plays I did I did I did um, little shop of horrors and were you were you I was Seymour <laughs> <laughs> and I was scarecrow and Wizard of Oz well, like, well that's what you get for being gangly. all the gangly, yeah. all the gangly parts I was a munchkin no I wasn't <laughs> but I would have been I was actually a narrator in the Wizard of Oz oh you oh I kept saying Dorothy it was like second grade. I said, Dorothy and her friends have gone. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I... And you did magic, and you're, did. you were involved in the church, because uh, your mom became an ordained minister, yeah. so you did magic in some working with kids, so theater, theater was, stuff was always there. Was, so I'm sure you were a good writer in school, English class was easy, that sort of stuff. That and, was, but, it was actually hard for me. Oh, right, because you were more science Yeah, based. yeah. Um, it took me a I was very uncomfortable with words. I, I, I still, to this day, I get nervous about grammar. Um, I get nervous about numbers. I hate, <laughs> I hate numbers because you can't, they don't, you can't fudge it. You know, in English, you can, even like if you're it. wrong with the answer, you can, you can do a good spiel. I'm like, ah, that was, no, give them a B. But numbers, you're either right or wrong. Well, but that's interesting. So, yeah, and, and I always struggled a lot with multiple choice tests because I could always figure out how every answer could, Adam. depending on the circumstances. <laughs> you were thinking right. too much. <laughs> and, but it sort of informs how I write plays, too, mm -hmm. where, where I can't bring any point of view into the room without thinking, well, but what would be the argument for that? Um, you know, uh, 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 and, and particularly kind of taking the sort of perverse point of view or, you know, the, this thing that, that I think Wally Shawn does it so well, where mm -hmm. he'll, have, he'll have a character just sneak in a preposterous, <laughs> offensive idea yeah. and just, you know, argue it in the most reasonable possible way. And, and, uh, Suddenly it's eugenics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's it's terrifying, but it's it, I think it's, um, it's good work for the brain because you want to get training at spotting when people are sneaking in dangerous ideas or like uh, deeply flawed ideas. So when did you write like a, a beyond a class assignment, like a story or a poem or something creative in that way, other than like your formula where you're going to solve it? Yeah. For Matt's theorem or something. Well, I think in high school I was drawn to plays very much in in uh, in the. The idea of writing a play to me was always about the idea of designing a set. Like I wanted to create you know, diorama boxes, and so I was drawn to people like Sam Shepard or actually Elmer Rice's Adding Machine. Very early on, was a play I saw that, that I was in New York. It was great. Uh, with, with the the opera or the, the I saw the opera. Yeah, didn't I? which is actually also really a fantastic adaptation. But um, uh, and I I, I, I had found a an old copy of Adding Machine in the school library that, that also had a scene that isn't included in any versions that are done now, too. So that was that was it kind of... an addendum, or was it part of the play? It was part of the play at the time, and then it was eventually cut, and... Um, because... I don't know, I don't know, but I've since, like, tried to find copies of the play that have a scene, and they don't have it. Uh -huh. and it's, uh, but, um, uh, but, yeah, I like these sort of really highly theatrical environments and so I would write plays but really it was an excuse to create 
theatrical spaces. Like you were a freshman, you were a sophomore, when did you well, write, this when was, did you write this a scene was, or a play? This was probably high school, roughly maybe junior year of high school. Mm -hmm. I started dabbling, then I went to NYU with the idea in mind that I was going to go into pre-med. I felt like uh, some some pieces suggested that your your mom was like maybe you'd be a minister, and I felt like you said, well, what a pre like I, I don't want to save souls, but maybe I'll save their body. Was that like an e you didn't want to say? Was there a sense of saying I don't I can't say I want to be a playwright, so I'll say I want to be a doctor because that's a little easy. It's a step away. Yeah, but it's I like, think that's true. And my mother wanted me to go into rock and roll. She like, oh, she you, did. yeah. She wanted me to be a, a like rock Christian and roll star. rock. Like no, a, no, no. She, <laughs> she, she wanted was, you to be jars she, of clay or something. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, she uh, she she actually came out of the music business. She, you know, well, right. you're, you're, born, she's, she's North Dame minister, but a hippie. Yeah, so, yeah, and, or half uh, a hippie, or two thirds a hippie. So that's that's what she always sort of imagined for me. Actually, um, they're in a geodesic dome. They're just hippies. <laughs> so, so, so what, rock and roll. Did you sing or play an instrument? I, I played piano, um, and I was actually not bad at it. And uh, I also played guitar a little bit. And yeah, I had a voice. I, I wrote I wrote songs. Uh, it, a couple of my early plays have songs in them. I haven't I haven't gone back to that in a really long time. Uh, I keep thinking I might. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, no, I, I, it was in college that I was sort of on this pre-med track, and then I had a uh, there's a mandatory class you had to take writing the essay, and I was terrified of this class. And I had this teacher, this woman named Megan Abbott. Right, who's, a, who's she's, a best selling thriller. Writer. Yeah, <laughs> and she, uh, she, she encouraged me. She, she, she let me even teach a class on uh, Laura Mulvey's essay about the, the masculine and feminine gaze in relation to David Lynch's Twin Peaks. <laughs> um, Which is a very timely topic. I know. Um, David Lynch has some women issues. He's a lovely he's, man, but he's working it out in his work. That's yeah, for sure. there's something. We, we, even as a freshman in college, I was really fascinated by that. It's like, what's going on there? It's like, there's a mutilated female body. That's neat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it was so. So I started reading. You know, in, in, in Megan's class, she taught us a lot. She taught us uh, Elaine Sixu and Marjorie Garber and Susan Judith Butler and and uh, Lacan and and. Um, Laura Mulvey, and so I was reading all of these um, gender studies texts, and, and uh, uh, it's just I found it really fun. And she she sort of encouraged me to to write um, not only academically but also creatively. And so I applied to transfer into the uh, Department of Dramatic Writing. Mm -hmm. And did you uh, did you have anything mounted in high school? Did any kids perform a scene of yours? Or? I I wrote a play pretentiously called The Zeitgeber. Um, the Zeitgeber? Yeah, which is a German... It's like the difference concept. of Zeitgeist? What is Zeitgeber? Zeitgeber is that which begins a cycle. And, uh, or, 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 um... And Gunther Dameron ends it, or, yeah, yeah Zeitgeber. Okay. Yeah, and, and so I wrote this play, and I, I, I directed and started it. <laughs> it <was laughs> you were Orson and Welles. <laughs> it was not a good but play. But thinner. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, it was, but it got it. You did it. Was it? Was it? Obviously, it was very serious. I assume. Yeah. Well, gamer. no, it was. It was. It was supposed to be funny. Uh -huh. um, I'm not sure that it actually was. <laughs> it sort of, more or less, kind of repeated the same scene over and over, and it was. Oh, uh, okay. It, it was slight variations. Yeah, and it was sort of. Um, uh, I hadn't yet read Beckett, but it was very Beckett before I read Beckett. I mean, I had been reading a lot of Sam Shepard and Albee, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it was more that than David Ives. Yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, that was exciting. You, if you yeah, went on stage. It wasn't like you thought, oh no. I mean, this is, again, if, all right, now you're in high school, you're staging, starring and directing a play. This is not uh, the idea that you would suddenly switch to a theater. It doesn't yeah, seem quite yeah, so shocking. Yeah, no, it was, it was all seemed almost predestined. Was it ever like, yeah, that's what I want to do. Or, or was it just, I'm going to try this? And, or when did you say, oh, I'm, I'm sunk, this question. is it? I actually think it might have been the, the, the former, that it was just sort of like, oh yeah, this makes sense. Mm -hmm. it, it was, the, it was the, the writing plays was the thing that in that freshman year of college, the thing that I was kind of doing in my own time, just dabbling, and I, I, kept, I kept coming back to it. And I was also, in, at that time, getting introduced to 
um, Carol Churchill's plays. And, and Richard Foreman. Foreman. Yeah. One of the first things I saw in New York was the ontological leader. Which and, one? Uh, I don't even remember now. It was it was dizzyingly odd and yeah. it was exciting. There was string everywhere, you know. It was very cool. Yeah, that, and that so much reminded me of, of, you know, some odd way Disney. You know, it sort of tapped into that thing that it, it that Richard Foreman's plays got me excited about theatrical space in a way that, that the theme park rides got me excited. And I, I actually always describe going to Foreman's theater as like a trip to the fun house. Right. And um, yeah, so they, they, and that sort of formed a big part of what I consider to be theatrical and, and uh, uh, made my own place look so different from that. But uh, his, it, Foreman's work was great training in just understanding how does the stage work? Because he was just such a master at sort of sustaining uh, sustaining interest and attention with the slimmest of yeah. of, of, of storyline. Yeah. yeah, you know the dramaturgy of a sound loop in Richard Foreman's plays is just utter genius. Like he knows exactly how to fade up a sound loop to kind of catch your interest as you're starting to drift away. Uh, dramaturg is a word that a lot of people don't know well or yeah. understand the role of it. Uh, explain what a dramaturg is. Uh, a dramaturg is a is a in their their role on productions can vary. So if you dramatically, uh, yeah. <laughs> so like a dramaturg on a production of Shakespeare uh, exists primarily to sort of uh, collect research historical context um, related to the play to kind of help the director and actors understand what it is they're doing um, to to help define words for actors and the director and um, and on new plays a dramaturg is almost can be playwright therapist i was about to say it is like a therapist it's someone's like the safe space they have no agenda except you yeah they're not the director who all they're all collaborating with you of course they're like oh you're taking my line you know so the actors the director this that they have no agenda the dramaturg except you and the yeah. piece as a whole and i i have one that i've been working with since 2010, uh, Sarah Lunny, mm -hmm. who used to be the, uh, uh, she started off as an assistant literary manager of Actors Theater, um, and that's where we st first started working together, and now she's uh, the, the literary manager at Playwrights Horizons, and, um, but uh, she's worked with me on many of my plays, uh, yeah. in including Dollhouse Part Two. Good. Yeah. And a number of people talk about your plays as being like on on page. They are kind of bemused and confused by it. And the actors, but Laurie Metcalf says, "Wow, it's the wide open possibilities of it." Do you sense when you look at your plays as pieces of uh, of uh, writing how uh, they seem a little different than others, or do you just avoid more um, yeah. descriptive, like do this, or what, what's going on there? Yeah, I mean, I, I do use very few stage directions. I mean, I, I have no problem with them, but I, 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 because I'm trying to preserve the rhythm of the dialogue, stage directions interrupt that. I mean, I've, I've messed around a lot with how my plays work. On, it's something I actually think about this a lot, how the, how the formatting of plays. Mm -hmm. and, um, it matters tremendously, like a poem. Yeah, yeah. Where and, do you break the line? And for example, the, the Disney play I think is incredibly hard to read on the page because that play is nothing but sentence fragments. That may have been the one I read. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really, really hard because you actually have to, you have to read it really fast to be able to catch it, but mm. you have to read it a couple of times very fast. <laughs> it, when you hear it out loud, it makes sense, but it, it, the, the way that the dialogue is constructed is I remove words you need to finish the sentence so that when the actors do it, and perform it and take out all the air in between lines, you actually think you're hearing them say words that they're not actually hearing, mm -hmm. but that doesn't make the process of reading it any easier. <laughs> um, so that one's especially hard. Uh, in Dawn's House Part Two actually had this kind of unusual formatting where, because I was so interested in sort of silence and kind of how characters kind of, there's almost these moments where uh, the characters encounter something. Okay, reset, let me try again. And I used blank pages in the script, and, and the, the the pages will just cut off abruptly and just start on a new page, and and um, and that but that turning of the page really makes a, a, a it's a, all right. Yeah. You know, it, so it, so the it reader matters. can feel how it works. 
Um, I took it out of that formatting because in rehearsal it's just really annoying. <laughs> because, you know, we would have these, you know, the Noren Torvald scene, Sam said, Turn. can we take out those blank pages? Because all I'm hearing is page turning and not silence. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, let's take them out. Um, but I, I am interested in, like, how can you make a play it, uh, read on the page like it does on the stage? And, and the poet Ann Carson actually is a big influence on me in terms of. I think she's really effective at using pagination and word placement and you know other poets too. Marion Moore is actually a favorite of mine. It's uh and, and that brings the issue of ebooks. Is it yeah. available as an ebook? Because that's a nightmare to deal with formatting because of yeah, people can make the print larger and smaller and it's really Well and I, I I know that, that Anne Carson gets super involved. I've heard that she you, gets really involved in those ebooks. You have to with poetry especially, it just it falls apart if you don't pay attention. Y y uh, but it's hard, they read on a phone yeah. or they read on a tablet, it's just, it's gonna, or a Kindle, it's gonna change. You know, I, I, I have not gotten so involved in the <laughs> ebook, and now I'm like, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, like just, great. I'm like thinking, uh, I need to add that yeah. to my list. And you know, on the audiobook, there's a laugh track, just like a sitcom. <laughs> Did you know that? Did they not mention that there's a laugh track in the audiobook version? When you've got the play, and you've seen these shows progress, it's, it seemed pretty uh, easy. Uh, from looking outside, it's like, oh, you did Humana, the New York yeah. Times highlighted you, you've had plays produced nonstop, uh, you probably have only had to eat, you know, wheat germ for a month at a time, right, early on, you've been okay, you're not like rolling in the dough, but you've had a steady succession of work. Does it yeah. feel easy or fun, or are you like, oh, sorry? It does, I, well, I mean, so there was 10 years where I couldn't get anybody to read my plays. Fair and enough. That was an okay. interesting, but that was an interesting period. But you're, you're 37 now. Yes, yes. So, so but your first uh, breakthrough was, or, or you manifest, or when, when, when did you have something stay? 2012, Death Tax at Humana. Death Tax was the role. Was, was the sort of my my proper professional debut. So that's five years ago, so you were about 32. Yeah. So it was 22 to 32, so yeah. you graduated from college and you started being a barista, or what did I, you do? I, so it, I used to, this is a this is totally random, but um, I ended up running the day to day operations and case intake for a not for profit legal organization, and then started teaching law students how to represent unemployment insurance cases. Um, case intake. What's this? It, so so it was an organization that uh, uh, represented unemployment insurance claimants who had been denied their benefits. Mm -hmm. And we're going to an administrative law hearing to get their benefits back. And I would. Um, As a drama major, of course, you were perfect to step in. And well, <laughs> in a weird way, yes, actually, because my, my job was to sort of was to talk to these claimants and figure out who had a case we could argue. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, didn't necessarily need to be a winning case, but we need to be able to make an argument. And so uh, th those are the those are the core elements of drama. You have to figure out, okay, what did you do? Why did you do what you did? Can I make a case for why it was necessary that you did what you did? Or reasonable to think that you would do what you did when you did what you did? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's storytelling. And um, uh, it, 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 uh, you can tell, it, it actually kind of informs my writing to a significant degree. There's a sense in which these monologues the characters deliver. They make their case. They make their case. They feel like hearings. Um, and again, the, the courtroom is another sort of presentational space. That and you've avoided it yet because it's too obvious for you? Or like, or you'll get to the courtroom at some point? So. Uh, it's on my list of things. I, I do actually want to find a way to reinvent the courtroom drama. I want to do a new version of the courtroom drama, but I'm not quite sure what it is yet. Mm -hmm. um, it's the bailiff, I think. Nobody talks about the bailiff. I, well, <laughs> I, you know, I did, it's funny you should mention that. I, I did dabble in one once that, that will never see the light of day, and, and the bailiff ended up being actually a really important character. <laughs> so it's funny that you said it. But uh, the Ministry of Law hearings look more like, you know, a meeting around a table with a, right. with a judge and, and uh, somebody recording, and um, that's an interesting theatrical space to me, too. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was it was great training. Listening to people every day tell me stories about difficult things that have happened to them, and, and trying to think through, wait, how do we solve this problem? And um, how long did you do that for? 
Uh, it was 10 years. It was 10 years. And, and you were writing all the time? Yeah. And, and hello, I, no big I had, a, I had this little basement office and windowless basement office and no one was around because I basically ran the whole place. So I would work all day and write all night down in the basement. You had a free basement. office space, yeah, at work. It was, it was actually kind of great. Um, but it, it meant that, that I, I developed kind of a, a body of work in that basement. And then, and then once I figured out um, how to get people to read my stuff, which was actually simply a matter of I realized at a certain point I wasn't really sending my plays out that much. <laughs> somebody asked me, I was complaining, no one, no, I can't get anything, no one, will, no one will read my plays. And somebody asked me, how many things do you submit to a year? And I said, I submit to lots of things. And then I counted, and it was like four, if even that. <laughs> and then I decided, okay, well, I'll, I'll submit to 20 things before the end of the year. And I think I made it to 11. Mm -hmm. but that's, that was enough. That changed it, and, and so I feel fortunate that I mean those ten years was hard, and but uh, I feel fortunate to have um, by the point that people started reading my plays, you know, they sort of asked, "Oh, this is great. Let's put this on. What else do you have?" I, I had ready. seven other plays. Have we caught up with you yet? I mean, I, I haven't seen. I haven't seen like half of your plays that have been produced. We could have a season at signature, and it would all be New York debuts for me. Has Death Tax been done in New York? Death Tax hasn't been done right. here. The um, Anna Nicole Smith, the uh, Hillary well, and Clinton. The Anna Nicole Smith is a ten minute, but oh, Hillary okay. and Clinton hasn't been done here. And uh, uh, the, I have a play about women's boxing mm -hmm. that um, has been done in a smaller workshop production, but uh, that one I'm that one I'm. I'm sitting on for the moment. I, 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 I sometimes just sit on the plays and I'll, I'll sort of continue to tweak them until I, I let people read them. All your plays are autobiographical, of course, because you wrote yeah. them. So and all the characters are pieces of you because you give them all their lines. So yeah. even if you don't, you know, you have to identify with them in some way. Uh, but is a, a doll's house um, divorce. You had a, your parents got divorced as a kid, and the play really does grapple with marriage and responsibility and leaving yeah. and coming back together again and making a, a really empathetic case for everyone in, in that situation. Yeah. Did that make it a little more personal for you? Yeah, and and you know it was also a play that I I started writing not too long after a significant breakup. Mm -hmm. So it's it's it is my breakup so you're single, play, yeah. and and uh, it's that song. It's your it's yeah. your Taylor Swift well, play. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm 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 no longer single, and I'm, I'm, but uh, uh, and, and, you funny know, how that happens when you get a play on Broadway. Suddenly you're not single anymore. <laughs> well, what was funny about it was that that, that um, I think the play's probably about at least two breakups, and and one where I think I'm Nora, and one where I think I'm Torvald. So, <laughs> uh, what are you doing? I've done everything you asked. Yeah. <laughs> So it was. Uh, so they're, you know, as as they're fighting, I have made both of their arguments. But you also make the argument of Condola Rashad as uh, the daughter, yeah. uh, who's so wonderful in the play. And I finally learned how to pronounce her name as well. It's a, it's a big day for me, Nathan <laughs> Condola. Uh, but uh, that is the person you were as a kid, the person with the two parents divorcing. I mean, divorce can be traumatic when they get a divorce and it can be traumatic when they don't get a divorce. Hi mom. So, you know, it, uh, it's, it's something that I, I loved her perspective as well, very much. Yeah. And I guess it's, there's, you know, the thing, the thing that sort of I, I took from myself is, you know, I talk about her as being kind of like the, a, a very typical child of divorce and that she kind of acts as diplomat. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a kind of, a, 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 a distance negotiation, um, stance that she takes with with Nora, and I, I think you know, in my experience, very very typical of, of the child of a divorce. But also, a lot of things she says are uh, things that that I've heard um, you know really really close friends say about their feelings about marriage and and uh, uh, relationships, and so. There's, there's a mix, there's a, a blending of different perspectives that, that wind up in, in the character of Emmy. Mm -hmm. Are you in a relationship or are you dating? No, I'm, you not in, know I'm, in, a, I'm oh, okay. in a relationship. Uh, 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 and uh, 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 she just she moved in with me about a week before we opened. Well, that's so. definitely a relationship. <laughs> if they move in, it's definitely a relationship. Yeah, no, it's, and it's great. It's sort of like it's. it's uh, uh, it, it's very funny to be opening this play as we're in the middle of sort of 
making a home for ourselves. And amid all the chaos. Amid all the chaos and also amid the conversation that the play creates. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's actually going great. You're like, can we, well, I should hope so, it's been weeks. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, as far as when moving in. But uh, you guys are like, let's use Sense and Sensibility as our template, not a doll's house. Let's not try and figure out who's Nora and who's Torval. Let's maybe go to, you know. Uh, no, I mean, I think I'd take Tracy and I think she's actually kidded me about that. She'll she'll say, uh, she'll she'll tell me when I'm starting to sound like one of the characters in the play. And every time you leave, shut the door. The uh, yeah, I've always thought of Tracy and Hepburn as my ideal uh, relationship. That bantering. Yeah. You, know, you fight, you fight, you fight, and then you make up. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, well, it's not so different from George and Martha too, actually. <laughs> well, I think yes. that there's I've heard the argument made with the lack of love. Yeah. Well, it? I've been surprised by the number of actors who have done Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf who come away saying, you know, I think it's actually a good marriage. <laughs> and I've, that's always been intriguing to me. And, and, and in fact, it's something that sort of was in the back of my mind while writing this play. And I, I'm very curious what that's a function of. But uh, a number of actors who have played those parts have, have made the case that they really do believe that they very much love each other. Mm -hmm. And that, that you know, this is how their marriage works. But I don't know if that's like uh, Stockholm Syndrome of, of playing those parts. And uh, I, I meant to ask somebody before I spoke to you, uh, so I don't want to be flippant, but uh, you said your next play is about your mom, mm -hmm. which to me immediately raised the question, is she still alive? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, because yes, yes, I was yes, like, yes. I often told my mom, oh, I got a great play, but you have to die first before I can put it on. So you know, yeah. she's like, what? <laughs> it's, it's a play composed from some interviews with her mm -hmm. about this strange incident that happened um, back in the late 90s when I was a freshman in college. And she was a hospital chaplain, and, and uh, it's about this, this very frightening incident that happened with her. Oh, she was taken a hostage. Yeah, patient. That she was working in the psych ward, and um, uh, and it's a play that she wanted me to write. Like she kept asking me to, and I kept saying, "Oh, I don't know, I don't know." It's too close. Yeah. And uh, then I came up with a way of doing it um, that I think is, I think works. So now I'm trying to think of what presentational <laughs> thing you gambit you're using on that. Huh? It's it's uh, yeah, it's a secret for the moment, <laughs> but it's it's a good one. It's mm -hmm. a good one. Okay. What do you do to, to you're, you're in the midst of award season, it's exhausting, you come home, you're like, I can't talk, and you collapse on the, on, the, on the couch. What do you do to relax, or even when you're working on plays? Is it music? Is it book? Can you read books while you're writing, or? I read a lot of nonfiction. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I am actually... Such as uh, Sartre, or something talking about uh, a psych wards, what or... Am I, what am I reading right now? I'm reading um, uh, this book called The Death of Expertise. Um, that just came out sort of Because we're all amateurs, right? everybody thinks they're an expert. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I, 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 I uh, actually am really interested in video games. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I do play video games. I just got a, one of the virtual reality headsets. So I'm trying to figure out how does that form work. Well, that's very interesting. I have friends at Khan who uh, they've just seen uh, Inaritu, who's a director I don't really care for that yeah. much. He sort of seemed like a one trick pony, but he's done a six minute virtual reality piece at Khan. It's in a giant warehouse outside of town and it has a sand floor, and you go in alone and you put on the goggles, and so you have the tactile experience of the floor, and boom, you're in the desert. You're absolutely in the desert between uh, Mexico and uh, the US, mm -hmm. California, whatever, Texas. And in the way, you're like, wow, I'm in the desert, you know, like, you, yeah. and then you see off in the distance people coming in, there are people being smuggled or, or escaping into America, and they're there, and then a helicopter comes in, and my friends say, you just, you can't, you have to duck, you cannot handle it, you know, you, and you just feel so much part, and then a truck comes up with soldiers and border guards, and they have guns, and they're pointing and screaming at you, and you're, you're trying to get out of the way, you're trying to hide, like, you can't stop yourself from not, and you're just immersed in that experience, and it's, it's not uh, like a movie done in VR, it's a different thing, it's an experience, and uh, this may be sort of the first step towards creating something that's not just, oh, cool, I'm on a mountain, yep. but an actual emotional experience, uh, as opposed to telling a story, it creates a moment, and a thing that you just can't have any other way. And they, they, if they say it feels like, well, the Hollywood Reporter said, it's like those early movies where they point the gun and the audience would scream around the way, yeah. like, oh, ha, ha, how silly they are, primitive fools in the 1800s. It's like, well, no, here you are ducking and cowering because it feels so real and it really feels like it might be the beginnings of uh, something kind of creative in a really interesting way.
Yeah, I, I no, I was thinking about it, the, exactly that the, the the anecdote about the, the train coming at the screen, the right. screen and the uh, audience fleeing. fleeing. And um, I've had a couple of moments sort of like that in, in virtual reality, and it's it's interesting. And I also kind of wonder if dialogue works especially well in VR, where. Um, you know, there's always a challenge with dialogue on screen. There's a, there's a, you have a limited level of interest in it. You Tell know, the as, Woody Allen. Well, and, 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 and I think how dialogue works on the screen ends up working, it, it's very different than how it works on the stage. And I've actually found myself kind of wondering if um, dialogue in VR actually might work a little more like it does on stage than on screen. Um, because one of the challenges with VR is also knowing where to look because you can't use the, the typical cinematic grammar of, of um, uh, you have to think you have to think like sleep no more yeah you have to think of immersive you have to think of which is why I don't know why they would build a new Broadway house with standard seating it should just be a flexible space yeah you know it, it's it, it, that would be fascinating actually if somebody did that um, but um, yeah, no, I think the Sleep No More is a, is a, is a good comparison, too. And, and, but I, I have found, I like watching um, um, documentaries and stuff on, in virtual reality, 360 documentaries. And, and uh, I find myself being much more interested in the presence of a person just standing in front of me, talking to me, than I would if I were just watching it on a flat screen. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's just, it's fascinating in a different way that feels more theatrical than it does cinematic. Hmm. Um, I've seen other people talk about how maybe VR is like just being in a wood and not not like you have to go explore them, but like you're just there and you're present and you're listening and, you're, and how somehow that makes you pay more attention than if you're actually in the woods. Yeah, no, that's, that. yeah, that, and uh, uh, I think that's true as well. Everything sort of becomes heightened in a way. Uh, the, the ordinary, um, the ordinary becomes extraordinary in VR. Mm -hmm. Well, Roger Ebert said, uh, call me when you have a video game that's a work of art. I know, and I've read it. And, so so like, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know, they're getting close, I think. Well, what's the closest to a work of art? Or when you hit a million on a, you know, for me, over on Asteroids, I admit mean, that's how old I am. You know. the, the, uh, there's, a, there's a game called Portal, and it has a sequel, Portal 2, that I think actually shocking, has... Shocking title. <laughs> really, it has extraordinary writing. Mm -hmm. um, it's beautifully written. It's a, it's, um, um, it's, a, it's a puzzle game, but it has this narrative that kind of sneaks up on you, mm -hmm. and is uh, the characters are completely original characters, and, and it, it's not a game that ever stops to tell its story. The, the movement through the game unveils the story. And so I think that, that one is actually probably about as close as I've seen. It builds on mist, a sort of sense of like, there's a more of a story than just a world to explore. Exactly, yes. It has all of the things that made mist interesting, plus a, an, an urgent story um, that has danger and it has stakes, and, and you come to realizations about who you are in the course of it. Um, that, that, I think, is... is is in fact a masterpiece. There's there's a university somewhere that for their freshman reading list includes that video game. Oh, that's cool. Um, and it's it's yeah, it's on that level, I think. So after the psych ward, we'll have a, a rock concert or a courtroom trial. Perhaps. Yeah, they're all percolating in the back. Well, and you know, I, I do have something that I've been working on for a little while. I do have a musical um, that Cesar Alvarez and I have been. Uh, very slowly working on that will be in the form of a concert. So, mm -hmm. and I've been watching a lot of concert videos. Um, concert videos, supposed to concert films, like obviously so stop making sense. Oh no, sorry, that's 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 well. I actually no, I think they in fact they are concert videos because they're not very professionally taken. They, they're not very professionally filmed, which is also something that I kind of like. About <laughs> them. So, but stop making sense was was a huge influence on me. I had this moment where I realized. I had seen it again for the first time in like maybe 2002, 2003, and I suddenly remembered, oh, my mother used to show this to me. And it made me wonder, oh, that, is that why I like the Worcester Group and Richard <laughs> Foreman? Because then I was like, this reminds me of Richard Foreman and Worcester Group. And of course it does, because it's in that, I mean, in fact, you know, like Joanna Glitus was the consulting director on it, yeah. Beverly Emmons, who did Einstein on the Beach, did the lights for it. 
the the big suit, in fact, was influenced by the Worcester Group. Right. And it's it's um, so it's funny how that all comes together. But that's a that's one that I go back and rewatch every so often. That's a seminal film for me. It was the first movie I got to see as a college student critic. And they said, oh, oh you, you can go, you know, I get to see it. And usually we did movies didn't come to Gainesville in advance. They just showed up. And so we didn't get, we had to go see them on Friday and then review them on Saturday or Monday. Yeah. This one, they had a print like a week earlier or something. And so we got to go along with the local critic. And the local critic didn't show up. So I'm in a single screen theater. And I didn't know I could bring a guest, though of course I could have. But like, it's empty. It's an entire, like, a th like the Ziegfeld, a thousand seat arena, empty. I know virtually nothing about Talking Heads. I had not bought an album yet. I listened to tons of music, but I just hadn't done them yet. So I knew Burning Down the House, but that was it. And I'm there at the concert alone in this space, and this movie comes up, and it was like, oh my God. You know, you run out and you buy the albums, like three albums right away, because it was so unbelievably good. Yeah. It was, it, just theatrically, the structure of it, just the sort of oh, idea the of bare stage, and oh. then we're going to slowly build the concert, and then, it, then it's going to just explodes, blow up. Until your head explodes. Until your head explodes. And uh, I, I think about that a lot when I'm building plays. I think I learned a lot about play structure from that. What was that first play that you saw, professional production, presumably, but maybe it wasn't, maybe it was even a high school thing that you saw and that you said, wow. I think it might have been a production of Christmas Carol. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, uh, and what appealed to me so much about it was the, uh, uh, well, it's got kind of like an anti-hero in it. I think I maybe I... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 I you think like that them. might have been exciting to me to sort of see a play about a grumpy person. And um, he's much more than a grumpy person. But uh, and the the it's a play with lots of magic tricks. Um, there's a lot of special effects, and uh, there's a lot of dry ice. And you know, yeah. I think that, that that stuff was exciting to me, and it, it probably reminded me of, of theme park rides and, and magic shows. And, and so I think that was maybe the one that hooked me. And it stuck. Yeah. Well, thanks for taking the time to oh, talk with you. me. This was, this was rejuvenating. Oh, <laughs> I really enjoyed the conversation. Well, I hope so. <laughs> I was sort of like, oh, do I have the energy for it? And this was really nice. Well, cool.